Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, Forty days from now Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jonas had something of a wild ride so far, hasn't he? This morning we find him on the beach, collecting himself. He's hit a turning point. He's repented. He's ready to take his first steps in the right direction, maybe after a shower first. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you this time. Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. Well, this is a dense first two sentences, so let's break it down a bit. It starts with, then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Throughout this series, if you're compiling a list of the characteristics of God's character, this one should make the list. God is a God of second chances. God is a God of second chances. Do you notice that God doesn't chastise or lecture Jonah? Do you notice that he doesn't give him the silent treatment? The prophet is still sitting in the sand, and the moment that he shakes the water out of his head, out of his ears, God is already speaking to him again. And I don't know about you, but I find that encouraging. And what was the ask? What is God asking of Jonah? Well, simply deliver the message. It's the same ask that God makes of all of his disciples, and that includes us. Our job is not conversion. Our job is not to convince. Our job is simply to extend an invitation. Because you're not going to argue or shame or scare somebody into the kingdom of God. And how does Jonah respond? Well, he obeys, which is kind of a turn for Jonah, if you're tracking. We have yet more directional language here. Jonah got up and he went. And if we're following through the series the directional language, we see that Jonah has been going down and down and down and down as far as he can go. He's been descending. And here we're going to see a a series of ascents. Jonah rode up in the great fish from the sea floor, up above the surface of the water. He stood up, and then he goes up to Nineveh. Now, mind you, he's not thrilled about it. He's not enthused by going to Nineveh, but he obeys. And the reason that Jonah is not chomping at the bit to go to Nineveh is complex. And we're going to talk more about it next week, but let's look at the most obvious reason. Nineveh, a city so large as it's described in our hearing this morning, 
In Hebrew, the translation is literally, Nineveh was a great city of gods. Nobody gasped there. That should make you gasp. Okay, in order for you to be properly shocked by this, you maybe need to understand Nineveh's reputation a little bit better. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, an empire, by the way, that wiped out 10 of the original 12 tribes of Israel. That's God's people now. Wiped them off the face of the planet. They were Israel's largest and most feared enemy. They are universally regarded as the most brutal and violent and oppressive of all the ancient empires. As I was doing research for this study and for this series and for this sermon, some of the descriptions of Nineveh's regular behavior turned my stomach. In fact, most of them are not appropriately relatable from this stage. The people of Nineveh were reprehensible. And I'm going to spare you the gory details. And if you have to look up some of these words, this is, uh, is, is going to be my clever attempt at uh, discretion via vocabulary. Okay? Because we have children in the room. Just to give you an idea, without all of the gory details of the kind of people Nineveh were, their calling card, the way that they were known, their reputation was public torture and humiliation with forced observation. So they would roll in to a city and they would gather everybody and form them in a large circle. And in the center of that circle, they would skin the leadership alive. They would immolate the city's children to end the bloodlines of that city. They would dismember the citizens in the most embarrassing ways possible and then decorate that city with the impaled corpses. Not a great place. Not a great people. And these people are described as belonging to God. I don't know about you, but for me, that's unsettling. It's really unsettling. The city not only belonged to God, but he was gravely concerned with the health of it. These violent, profane Gentiles mattered to God. We have all things that belong to us that we ignore, right? I bet if you went home this afternoon, you could probably lay your eyes on a few. But God doesn't ignore what belongs to him. So I want to tell you why one of the themes that we're tracking through Jonah is the scandal of grace. God deeply loves people that you hate. Let that marinate for a second. God views the people that you like the least as precious. Yeah. Even them. Even Steelers fans. I'm just kidding. Don't rush the stage. It's just a joke. I don't even watch sports ball. Uh, it's just a joke. Sorry. Easy expense. The city of Nineveh is described as it took three days to see it all. Well, we talked about this last week, but this is an idiom. And we know that because the average walker at a pace of just three miles an hour could easily cover 30 miles a day. And a city of 90 miles across would fit inside this circle. Tampa and Orlando combined aren't that big. And it's supposed to be describing a single city. And, and by the way, neither was any city in the ancient Near East this big. Archaeologists have revealed that the city was likely seven miles in diameter. The description is hyperbolic, meant to signal to us the magnitude of the world's problems. There's stuff that we see in the world all the time that could easily be described as belonging in or to Nineveh. I'll, I'll just let you fill in the blanks. 
like some kind of morose Mad Libs. I mean, we know what's in the news, and we know what turns our stomachs. And we're drawn to ask, if God is loving and in control, why doesn't he just stop it? Why doesn't he intervene? How could he allow these things to go on? And they asked the same questions about Nineveh for a long time. And what did God do about it? Did he send an army to shut it all down? Uh -uh. God waited until Jonah would be obedient, and he sent him. One guy who didn't even really want to go in the first place and who didn't go in guns blazing but walked in and said the small thing that God had asked him to repeat. What version of Nineveh is God asking you to walk into? God sent his representative into the city, and on the day that Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, the Hebrew here describes uh, Jonah walking partway into the city and firing off a five-word sermon. In Hebrew, it's just five words. And the English doesn't really paint the full picture. Because in Hebrew, the word that we just read as destroyed is one of those Hebrew homonyms. The word is actually overturned. And it can mean overthrown or destroyed, but it can also equally mean transformed or changed. So the message is simply 40 days until Nineveh is overturned, which means it will either be destroyed or it will have a change of heart. It will be transformed. The message has shifted slightly, right? Now, now this is the second time that God has tasked Jonah to go and deliver a message to Nineveh. And in chapter 1, the message that God sent with Jonah sent Jonah running. In the first chapter, God tells Jonah to proclaim judgment. Go tell them they're on my hit list. But here in the third chapter, the message has shifted slightly. God says, with specific and intentional ambiguity, go and proclaim what I will tell you. So not even Jonah gets the full message. And Jonah for sure notices that the assigned message has changed since he was first asked. Jonah arrives in Nineveh wishing that camels had tinted windows and door locks, and he says what God tells him. Now, it would be easy to pin the brevity of his message on the fact that Jonah doesn't want to be there or deliver it in the first place, and I'm not going to suggest that doesn't play a a role in it, that that's not a part of it, but we also have to remember that Jonah is being obedient, delivering the message that God gave him, so Jonah's not improvising here. He's delivering what he perceives to be an unwelcome and unpopular message. And the message itself likely shakes Jonah to his core because the message has gone from one of damnation to one of potential hope. And here's where this crosses into our lives. God tells Jonah, go open your mouth and I'll do the rest. I will give you the words, and I will be responsible for what happens next. Are we willing to do the same thing? When the Lord sends us into undesirable undesirable places, we go equipped and protected. He's not going to send you into Nineveh alone. Jonah didn't go into Nineveh alone. He hasn't been alone this whole time. The Lord is right next to him, whispering in his ear, telling him what to say. Are we willing to trust 
that our obedience to deliver the message, even if we perceive it to be unpopular or an imposition, can we trust that God's going to work in ways that we can't see? That maybe he's been working behind the scenes in ways that we know nothing about so that our words land differently than we think they will. Can we trust God with that? And honestly, I mean, let, honestly, really, what's the risk? What's the risk to you, really, about telling people about God's love? That they might think you're a little weird? I hate to tell you, that ship's already sailed. They already think you're weird for one reason or another. In fact, I'm willing to bet that you loving God is probably the least weird thing they consider about you. What's the risk? Everybody's a little weird. Everybody. It's, it's why people watching and eavesdropping and gossiping and reality shows exist. Jonah is obedient. And what God does with that little bit of obedience is astonishing. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. This is not the response Jonah expected in a million years. And the word translated believed in Hebrew is probably better rendered trusted. The the people of Nineveh trusted God. They trusted, one, that he would absolutely follow through on his claim and destroy their city. Because they remembered the city of Sodom, which we'll talk more about next week. And two, they believed that because the word Jonah used was overturned, and it could mean transformed, that maybe, just maybe, there was hope if they turned things around, if they repented. And their trust was made real in action. Our trust is made real in action. They repented. But Scripture never tells us that they began worshiping God. Did you notice that? They said, man, what we've got going on is not great. Maybe we should do something about that. So what does that tell us? Like the sailors... In chapter 1, they immediately converted. They started worshiping God and offered a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. That's not what happens in Nineveh. The people repent. They stop doing evil. They don't necessarily convert. So what does that tell us? It tells us the people can stop doing bad things and not become Christians. But their repentance is still a win that God can use. And the people of this world are interconnected in ways that we can't even begin to fathom. We can't see what God can. And that's kind of the point of the book of Jonah. The word that you share with someone might not result in them becoming a believer. But it will always, always have an impact whose ripples you can't begin to comprehend. Scripture promises us that. Look at the ripples in Nineveh. The citizens hear and respond to the message to such a degree that the king hears about it. And the king hears the message, and he's so moved that he issues a decree and reaches the entire rest of the city, which we've already established, is massive. Can you imagine the impact on this city? If we were obedient and we walked into our version of Nineveh and declared, God cares about you, 
We see more directional language. The king hears this. He gets up immediately and and comes down off the throne. He rejects all signs of his claim to power and he covers himself in ashes and mourning clothes. The king is so moved that he sends out his decree that every person and their pets and their livestock need to pray earnestly and stop doing evil things and abandon their violent way of life. No more murderous cows. Now, the decree's comical inclusion of the animals is designed to draw our attention to the scope of this city's corporate repentance. Everybody, even the animals, fasted and wore mourning clothes. And the king's final line of this decree, it mirrors the cry of the sailors back in chapter 1. Who can tell? Who can tell? Perhaps, even yet, God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. The king isn't certain. He knows the story of Sodom, which we'll talk about next week, but he is hopeful. And that level of humility is something that God responds to consistently, over and over and over again. So hear me. God's not asking you to be certain. He responds to your hope and your humility. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he had threatened. Nineveh Nineveh had been bad for a while. They had a legacy of awfulness. But it wasn't beyond hope. Because of Jonah's obedience to utter five words, God forgave generational sin and offered mercy in the place of wrath. And Jonah's journey made Nineveh's repentance possible. And it's my hope and my prayer that the Lord has the same thing in store for us. For all of us. Next week, we're going to close out our series and we're going to see the effect that Nineveh's unexpected response has on Jonah. And Jonah is going to reveal to us and to the Lord why he didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. And I promise you, it's not what you think. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, We give you thanks for the scandal of grace. We give you thanks that your mercy is wide enough and deep enough to swallow us all. We give you thanks, Lord, that you are not giving up on your children. You do not give up on what belongs to you. And Lord, while it's hard to to speak up for you sometimes, when it's hard to find our voice, Help us to trust that you will give us the words, that what you're asking is for us to just extend the invitation to be brave enough to take the chance and open our mouths. Lord, we pray for this world and all of the places and all of the situations and all of the circumstances that might rightly be described as belonging to Nineveh. Help us to see our Nineveh the way that you saw this Nineveh. Not the way Jonah sees it, Lord. Help us to see it the way you see it so that we might be obedient and we might go and we might open our mouths. And Lord, we trust what you're going to do with that. We trust that you are going to do something that we can't even comprehend. And even if we don't get to see the fruit of it, Lord, We're going to trust that you're working in ways that we can't even begin to fathom. 
Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we ask that you would encourage us, and strengthen us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.